I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always introduce myself because we're on the Internet. Some people have not seen us or heard us. I do not teach like any other preacher in the world that I know of. I go to the Greek text. I'll give you the Greek words. I may put 50 Greek words on the board in one lesson and tell you if it's an adverb or an adjective or a participle or a pronoun or a noun. I'll tell you what tense it is, if it's past or if it's aorist indicative, which is past tense or present tense. And I'll give you the part of speech and culture and customs and idioms and metaphors. I'm not new at this. I'm 84. I've been teaching, studying Bible. I started when I was 17 back in 1956. And I'm trying to tell people the un varnished truth. I'm very controversial because I correct the preachers where they're lying. Now, we're on the internet all over the world and people are watching us. Uh, Shanna Joseph from Brooklyn writes, Dear Jim Brown and Grace and Truth Ministries, I thank God for your ministry. I've been blessed by your teaching since April 2009. I've been learning about predestination, revelation, pagan holidays, baptism, doctrine of the devil. I've also obtained some of your recommended literature, such as Strong's Concordance, Arthur Pink's The Sovereignty of God, Matthew Henry's Commentary. I wanted to know if you make any tracks. I've got a whole slew of them over here on the wall about 70-something that I wrote, oh, probably 30, 35 years ago. If you do, then can I have some? You can have all of them. We'll send them to you. Just keep them in a book so you can make copies and give them away. Or a DVD that is centered on the gospel. I wanted to give you give to some people in my life. If you get all those tracks, there's a college education in those tracks. I'll take a word, I'll take a verse, a word out of the verse, I'll give you the Greek definition, and now I'll go into the body of it explaining it. That is an education in itself. God bless you forever, Shanna Joseph from Brooklyn, New York. We love you, Shanna. Keep writing to us. Angel in Colorado, Angel's uh, dear lady, she lost her leg years ago and she came down here for the picnic and drove all the way herself. And she says, Jim Brown, thank you for the DVDs and articles about Christmas. I came down with COVID on Wednesday in the middle of the night. I thought I was going to die. At first, I was praying for God to have mercy on me and not to let me die. Then after a while, I started praying for His will to be done and submitting to it. It was a long night. I tested myself the next morning, and I was positive for COVID. I've had a variety of symptoms the last few days, but today... I finally feel pretty good. I haven't been able to watch any of your videos on the COVID as I just couldn't concentrate or think, really. I am going to watch you today live and find the COVID videos I saw before. I hope you are all you are doing well. And I pray for your strength to continue. Well, God be in frail, family. Yours, Angel in Colorado. We love you, Angel. Keep writing. Then Michael in Las Vegas, he keeps writing. Michael, make your questions simple. You try to stay difficult, and that's not right. First reason I've been told by scholars why the Twin Towers fell by God. I've told you why they fell. 
It's not why you're saying. Because it was America's Tower of Babel. That's not right. Mike, don't tell me what the Bible says. You're not watching my DVDs. Towers show a nation as evil and proud. It's not why they fell. Let me tell you why they fell. Why they fell. In 1517, let me race this up here. I don't need that. In 1517, the Ottoman Turks, the Turkish Empire, excuse me, that's not A-U-T-O, it's O-T-T-O. O T T O. The Ottoman Turks overthrew most of the Middle East and most of the people in Israel or in Canaan at that time, it was called Palestine. About 90% of the people were, they were Muslim. Arab people. And then in, so they considered they owned the land. Possession is nine points of the law. So they figured they owned it. And then in, in 1917, I've taught this to you before, you need to learn it. 1917, the British government under their uh, famous general, General Allenby, came into Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem in the name of the Allied forces. Allied would be the United States, and believe it or not, Russia was our ally at that time and uh, Russia, and France, and everybody that, and the English that were on our side. And, and General Allenby came in and took, and took Israel. Well, it, this went under, it, they became, Israel became a satellite nation of Great Britain. a satellite nation of Great Britain. And then in 1920, there was an issue, there was a, it was a, uh, it was a, a law issued to the English, the English and the Arabs. It was issued to the English and Arabs. It was a very shaky law. It didn't really, the Arabs thought it meant that they were going to be made, given the nation of Israel, and the, and the, the Arabs thought that, and so did the Jews. And that, that Balfour Declaration, that was a Balfour, it was for a certain amount of time. Mr. Balfour was the he was the uh, ambassador to Israel, and that would that would terminate May fourteenth, nineteen forty-eight. All the time that Balfour Declaration was going on, Israel and the and the Arabs and the English. Israel and the Arabs, Israel and the Arabs, were constantly at war fighting one another. And the, and the Arabs said, if they considered this land theirs, and they said, if anyone comes up and backs Israel, That they were, you were in a war with them. They would declare an immediate war. 
And the May the 15th, after Israel was declared a nation, May 14, 1948, and, and, the, and America backed Israel. The Arabs said, we are at war with you, the 15th. That's why they started attacking America and Israel. That's why the, the towers came down. Those guys wasn't trying to attack the Babylonian Tower of Babel. They were trying to attack the people who backed Israel because they considered that land theirs. That's why, in a sense, you can't blame those guys, can you? They've been living in the land for 400 years, farming the land. And when, uh, when you go out into uh, some field and you tell a farmer that you tell a farmer, you're going to have to get off your property. And he's been... He's been farming some land here for 50 years. And he said, and he's an Arab. And he says, I've farmed this land for 50 years. My father's farmed it for 50 years. His father farmed it for 50 years. And then you're going to take it away from me? They don't know the land was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they could care less. Do you blame them for feeling the way they feel? So the fact that they thought they owned it for 400 years until 1917, that's why it came down. That's why the Twin Towers came down, because they believed they were right. And the Jews believed they were right. What's the answer? Well, it's not any answer. It's a distress of nations with perplexity. You need to listen to what I'm teaching you, Michael. That's why it came down, and that's not even that's not even up for question. They had a law. It was called Al Fatah. This was an Arab law. The Al Fatah was if anyone tries to stop tries to stop this, this advance of Islam, they were at war with you. And that war has been going on ever since. And they're not through with America, not by any means. They're in a holy war against America, and they want to destroy us. But there's not any answer, because they think they own the land. And the Jews say, we own the land, because it was given to our father Abraham. They say, no, 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 it was given to Ishmael, and it wasn't if you, if you believe the Bible. If you believe their so-called holy book, then you'll believe that. Enough for that. And then he goes on to say, America builds one world, world trade center because self is stubborn. That's not what it's about, Michael. Don't write to me and instruct me. Ask me, okay? One world trade center is a clue to the new world order. No, the world trade center is gone. They want a one world ruling beast system. Well, there'll be one. Second reason scholars tell me, you're listening to the wrong scholars. The same year, 1973, before Twin Towers were finished, Roe versus Wade happened. What does that have to do with world system? Nothing. That just is another sin of America. We see heathen rage and beast and Baal worship abortions. You sure are mixing things together, Mike. Please explain if heathen rage ties into where you teach that wrath from goats will praise God. What? Wrath from goats? 
Be patient with me. I have a hard time, Michael. I'm not understanding how goat's wrath praises God. The wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. God's going to get just as much praise when he casts vessels of wrath into hell as when he takes us to heaven. And why would God want their praise? He's going to be praised at men's destruction. Michael in Las Vegas. Michael, you're very confusing on your letters. I don't know if you're just wanting to be heard or want attention or what. Don't in, don't write to me and instruct to me when you don't know nothing about what you're talking about. And then I got a letter from Nakomo in South Africa. My name is Mizzy, M-S-I-Z-I, Nakomo, N-K-O-M-O, from the Republic of South Af Africa. I have been following your teachings, and I would like to know if this is in line with Scripture. First Peter 4, 6 seems to open the second and another chance of the dead. It, no vessels of wrath have a chance for to be saved. To be preached unto. Let me read that to you. First Peter 4 and 6. And for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Paul says in 15th chapter 1 Corinthians, we were baptized for the dead. He's saying we went through a blood baptism for the dead elect and then God will bring them alive. I've preached on that many times. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. They're elect, but they're dead in sin. And we preach so they can come alive. That's what Paul said in the fourth chapter of First Corinthians. He says, let me tell you this. Fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, oh, wait a minute. Second Corinthians, I don't know what I'm thinking of. Fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, he says, so death worketh in us, so that this is the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Well, it's down in verse 12. So death worketh in us so that life can work in you. When you're dead in sin, we die daily so that we can reach the dead elect. And then they go on to say, First uh, Peter three nineteen through 20. I've preached on this a hundred times at least, or mentioned it 200 times. Down here in 1 Peter 19, this is an all-day affair to preach on this. It's talking about the spirits in prison. Prison is the word phulake, P-H-U-L-A-K-E. It means the division of day and night or light and dark. A light and darkness. What is the division of day and night or light and darkness? It's the horizon. Horizo. pro -horizo. Pro is the word predestinate. It means to predetermine for the light. And Paul says, you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I can talk about this all night. Because the Gentiles were in prison. They were in darkness from Adam until Jesus. And now God is calling the Gentiles to his light. And that's what Isaiah says all through his book. He's calling them to the light. And he says, but, but which he went and preached unto 
the Gentiles that had been in prison. The Bible says that they were in prison in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah, 42nd chapter. I'm going to go back and preach on the spirits in prison because all Isaiah's message is about the Gentiles being in the dark. In that 42nd chapter, I, he's talking to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. And we'll, this is verse 6, chapter 42. I, the Lord, called thee to righteousness and will hold thine hand and keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. That's the Gentiles. They were in darkness all this time. And Paul said, I was a missionary to the Gentiles to call those from darkness to light. I could talk about this a long time, but I'm not going to do that. It, look for my spirits in prison on the Internet. I've got at least 2,000 messages on the Internet. There's a whole bunch of spirits in prison messages on there. Nicole Mall, I hope this will help you some. Dylan Schuwaller writes to us from Texas. I love watching, dear brother Jim, I love watching your recent testimonies video that happened after the cookout. Everyone has touched my heart and reminded me that though I feel alone and though I feel snared, I'm free from the bondage of sin. I wish I was as joyous, eager, and willing to just start telling everyone the truth as I was when I first heard these messages. Well, you'll strengthen in time. At times, I feel as though the Lord isn't in my life. Well, that's natural for a young man who's got the juices running through his body, as though I am not the Lord's. Well, that's because you got an inner man and an outer man. The outer man makes you feel like you don't belong to God. The outer man seems to be getting in the way of everything in my life. You said the magic word there, the outer man. If you recognize you've got an outer man, you've got an inner man. That's Christ in you. I hope I am old enough to get over myself. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> You're awful young in your 20s. You won't get over yourself for years to come, and you'll be wrestling with it from now on. You'll be agonizing over sin. I hope I'm old enough to get over myself. I often think of myself as Narcissus, the man who looked at himself in the reflection of a pool after needing some water, then just fell so deeply in love with himself, he stayed out until he died. That's every man I know. It's not just young men. It's every man I've ever met. I wish mirrors weren't invented. Nice cars, scandalous women, money and alcohol. Well, it has been. And it tempts us all. It's hard to just stay in the right way and focus on the Lord. You sound like you're getting a hold of it. I constantly think of God, but continue to fall, fall weak to the flesh. That's everybody, especially every young man I've ever met. I'm not trying to make excuse for you. I'm just saying you're going to fall to the flesh, that outer man. I hope to be whipped into shape. You will be. might take 25 years, but you will be. It truly is a struggle. Sorry if I'm always burdened with my me complex. Well, me is the biggest problem in the world. I hope everyone is doing well, and if everyone, anyone could ever like to talk with me, please do. 
I give my number out to everyone willing to talk or text. I'll give it to you if you want to come up here and get it. Agape and Fleo, Dylan Schuwaller in Texas. Dylan, you're going through everything I went through as a young man, so don't worry, you're coming along. The fact that you know this, that's the inner man screaming out inside you. That's the new birth in you. We love you, Dylan. Keep writing. Austin Babb in Arizona writes, Dear Pastor Brown, thank you for the DVDs. I'm hoping to one day have a personal library of books and of your teachings. Thank you for unwavering commitment to the truth. I had a question about which concordance you are using. I have a concordance from 1960, but its definition of baptism is to immerse or to dip. You got to get one that says to whelm, to cover, because it doesn't mean to dip. I just wanted the truth. I feel defeated knowing that even information from 80 years ago is apostatized. If if you're going to get a concordance, get this one right here. Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. This is, you got to get one that has baptizo to whelm. To whelm means to cover. It doesn't mean to dip. And some men have gotten a hold of these and have abridged them and put definitions in them that are not there. I don't know if you've got, let me, let me just hold on. Hold on. Don't get an abridged concordance. They've changed some words and added some words, and I've said that many times before. Let me see here. ISBN, copy this down, 0 dash eight. Four zero seven dash six seven five zero dash one. Let me write that on the board. Zero dash eight four seven. Zero dash eight four seven. Zero dash eight four zero seven. O seven. Uh, 6750 6750 dash 1 that's the ISBN number ISBN maybe that'll help you when you get in a abridged there's certain words that they don't put in the abridged like put If you get a concordance, it doesn't have the word put in it. It's wrong. Because you've got all kinds of words for put. Let me make sure this has got put in it. Hold on. O-P. That's one word that I used to, I usually just want to make sure, P-R-S-T-U, okay. Yeah, you've got, looks like several hundred words for put. You've got... You've got a half a dozen different words for put, 5087, 2623, 803, 1808. These are all New Testament words. So that's got the right one in it. They'll just say, see, 
index or something like that. They'll, if you go back to the back, it'll be one word. I don't believe in that. All right. So I hope that'll help you at all, Austin. Get an old one, but I don't know what kind you've got. All right. Keep writing or call me and we'll talk about it. And then the Neves family. Greetings, beloved Pastor Brown. This is the Neves family. Right here. In this tax picture, you see me and my family. From left to right is my wife, Jenny, 56 years old, myself, 56, my daughter, Erica, 22. Seated is my 98-year-old mother. She's an older woman, isn't she? Goodness gracious. As you already know, we are originally from Puerto Rico. However, my daughter was born in Orlando, Florida. For many years, this little family was lost, always confused, and was extremely ignorant of the Word of God while we were inside the bowels of a horrible, extremely deceitful doctrine called Pentecostalism. That is corruption. Yet God, in His great mercy, has been teaching me the true gospel through your teachings, Pastor Brown. I no longer will be fooled by false doctrine. Pastor Brown, I wish you could have been, have seen the transformation in this family. You, Pastor Brown, truly are a vessel, an angel, a messenger of the truth that God has put in you. We love you. Thanks so much for everything. The Neves family, Eric, Je Jenny, Erica, and Mom in Florida. We love you guys. Thank you so much for the picture. We appreciate it so much. And boy, your mom sure lived a long time, didn't she? I'm glad she found the truth. All right. I'll give you a few. I'll, I'm going to read some of Mary's. My wife, is. she's kind of afraid of the COVID. That's why she don't come. She's got a lot of health problems. Her blood pressure slides up and down and does some things like that. And, uh, and she, she's, she reads her Bible. She's read through the Bible twice this year, and she's on her third time through. And uh, she's written, she got these sayings off the Internet, but it takes her a long time, I mean a long time, to put one of these books together. You can say, well, those are something somebody else said. That's right. Most people won't go on the Internet to look them up. Most people won't go on the Internet to do anything except play games. I keep suggesting that you go on the Internet to learn. And she will, it takes her weeks to make up one of these books. She has to go through, cut it out, tape it in a book, and then Tom will have it printed. These books are going to cost about after they get through mailing them out, there's not hardly any money left in it. Uh, we, what we're going to do is sell them for twenty dollars a piece. They cost somewhere in the neighborhood of sixteen fifty, I believe it is, something like that to print. Then, time we put them in the mail to mail them to you, there's not going to be anything left on them. And uh, these are sayings of some famous people. There are people that believed in predestination, people like Martin Luther and A.Z. Tozer and uh, J. Uh, what's his name, J.C. and Mr. Whitfield and, and uh, I can't think of his name. I'll read one of them here in a minute. 
But Martin Luther said, whenever the true message of the cross is abolished, the anger of hypocrites and heretics eases. They get easy on you when you abolish the cross. And all things seem to be at peace when you quit preaching the cross, the daily cross, that is. That's by Martin Luther. Then Luther says again, Unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is either right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. I believe he said that when he was standing before the council at Worms, Germany, when he was called down for placing his 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg, Germany. A.W. Pink, it's not a question of what I think or what anyone else thinks. It is what saith the Scriptures. It is not a matter of what any church or creed teaches. It is what teaches the Bible. God has spoken. That ends the matter forever. O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. A.W. Pink. John Calvin said these words. God preordained for his own glory and the display of his attributes of mercy and justice a part of the human race without any merit of their own to eternal salvation. That's God's elect. And another part in just punishment of their sin to eternal damnation. He's talking about predestination there. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he believed in predestination. It is not entertainment we need. It is truth. It is knowledge. Thank you, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And then George Wishart had I taught man's doctrine, I had gotten great thanks by men. But for the word's sake and the true gospel which was given to me by the grace of God, I suffer this day by men not sorrowfully, but with a glad heart and mind. Then, Charles Spurgeon again. If you are true and faithful to the Most High, men will resent your unflinching fidelity. They will resent it. They hate me for it. Since it is a testimony against their iniquities, fearless of all consequences, you must do right. You will need the courage of a lion unhesitatingly to pursue a course which shall turn your best friend into your fiercest foe. But for the love of Jesus, you must thus be courageous. Charles Spurgeon. And then I would like to apologize to anyone I have not yet offended. Please be patient. I'll get to you shortly. <laughs> I like that. I like to apologize to anybody I haven't offended. If you'll be patient, I'll get to you shortly, okay? <laughs> That's funny. And then, uh, I don't know who this is by. The duty of theologian, however, is not to tickle the ear, but to confirm the conscience by teaching what is true, certain, and useful. And then Charles Chenequy, he this was Father Chenequy, who spent 50 years in the Church of Rome, then was converted out of it. Now, we've got books, got a book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. You can order that from Jack Chick Publication in Ontario, California. Chenequy, 
because modern Protestants have not only forgotten what Rome was, what she is, and what she will forever be, the most irreconcilable and powerful enemy of the gospel of Christ. But they consider her almost as a branch of the church whose cornerstone is Christ. Like he says, that's not true. John Bunyan, when a person becomes a Christian, it is no longer a priority to listen to the world. It is no longer a priority to care what the world may think. Everything changes. The world looks completely different. All of the temporal pleasures of this world become less enjoyable because a greater joy has been found. Thus, you place your fingers in your ears for you no longer care about the world's opinion. You run like a lunatic crying, life, life, eternal life. That was John Bunyan. G. Gratia Machen, one of the great Greek scholars of all time, if we are really convinced of the truth of our message, then we can proclaim it before the world of enemies. Then the very difficulty of our task, the very scarcity of our allies becomes an inspiration. In other words, we don't have many friends. Then we can rejoice that God did not place us in an easy age, but in a time of doubt, and perplexity and battle. That's what we're in this for. Martin Luther always preached in such a way that if the people listening do not come to hate their sin, they will instead hate you. When you tell the truth, St. Augustine, great scholar from thousands of years ago, people hate the truth for the sake of of whatever it is that they love more than the truth. They hate the truth for the sake of what they love more. People love truth when it shines warmly on them and hate it when it rebukes them. That's right. A.W. Pink, great scholar, died in 1952. Do you imagine that the gospel is magnified our God glorified by going to worldlings, to people of this world, telling them that they may be saved at this moment by simply accepting Christ as a personal Savior. He's making fun of that because that's not true. While they are wedded to their idols and their hearts are still in love with sin, if I do so, I tell them a lie pervert the gospel, insult Christ, turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. He was born in 1886 and died in 1952. When asked, when Martin Luther was asked, will you recant, will you partake of the sacrament of the Mass? He said, no. He did not ponder to the powers that be to save his own skin. He stood before this council at Worms, Germany. He stood before the king and said, My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. Ready to die. These men that I'm reading, they say some great things. They just, they were ready to die for their belief. There's so many Christians this day and time. I call them Christians. Maybe they're not. They're not willing to die for the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, although we are sure that men are not saved for the sake of their works, Yet are we equally sure that no man can be saved without them? You're not saved by works, but you're saved by working faith. That was Charles Spurgeon. I'll read a couple more of these. A.W. Pink, 
Multitudes make profession and claim to be saved, but the life gives no evidence that they are strangers and pilgrims here on earth or that they are treasures in heaven. He's saying just because you say it, don't mean it. They are afraid of being thought narrow and peculiar. I think that's true of a lot of believers. They don't want to be thought to be narrow and peculiar and strict and puritanical. Satan has deceived them. They imagine that they can get to heaven by an easier route than by denying self, taking up their cross daily, and following Christ. None can dwell with him eternally who do not in this world loathe Resist and turn from all that is repulsive to a pure eye. Thank you, Mr. Pink. Jonathan Edwards. We find it easy to tread on and tread on and crush a worm that we see crawling on the earth. So easy is it so easy is it with God when he pleases to cast his enemies into hell, Jonathan Edwards. Maybe a couple of more of these. I want to be so full of Christ that if a mosquito bites me, it flies away singing, there's power in the blood. <laughs> and then uh, Michael Jeshurun. No matter how clearly we prove from both scripture, history, and logic that Christmas is a pagan abomination which the Lord hates, the nominal Christian will continue to observe it and justify it. Remember to support the banks and corporations this Christmas in their continued efforts to enslave mankind by spending money they they haven't got on needs they don't on things they don't need. That'll be enough on this. I'll give you a few announcements. We are on TV all over the country. I'm canceling some of the TV if I don't hear from some of you people. It takes money to be on TV. We've been spending about twelve thousand a month on our TV stations. It's going to take a lot of money to stay on the TV. And I'm I'm not going to stay on if you're not interested in it out there. But we are on the Internet all over the world. That's where all of our emails come from. These are people who love the truth. Got to get me a drink. D-R-A-N-K, drink of water. We're on the internet, we get emails from everywhere, and we try to communicate with a lot of people by helping them financially. We don't just give money to anybody, it's people that stay in touch with us, they love the truth, they discuss the truth with us, and when I come to find out they're really in a struggle, we take them on to give them some regular money. We've got people that have got leukemia and cancer got a lady in australia that's got cancer we got a lady in amarillo that's got leukemia and we send her 300 dollars every month we got a lady down in southern louisiana that's that's paraplegic she had a car wreck and made her paraplegic 15 years ago we've asked for donations for her to buy her a wheelchair accessible van and we've brought in enough money to do that she's going through a rehab unit down in Louisiana it's going to take her about 12 weeks and then we'll buy her that van and uh, but if you want to give to these needy people make your check to Grace and Truth Ministries and put on the bottom of it so much money for the ministry and so much for 
the needy and you stipulate what you want it for. That'll be enough announcements. And uh, let's pray. I will, I will tell you that uh, Michael Kravitz had his heart attack and he's not able to take a bunch of phone calls. So he doesn't want people calling him because he's trying to recoup. And uh, we sent him some flowers the other day and uh, just to let him know that we cared. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us in everything. Help me and give me strength to continue this work. Lord, I get real depressed at times. I go through depression for weeks at a time because we're preaching to a world that doesn't want the truth. Only few will find this narrow way. It's very discouraging, but we will not stop by your grace. Fight our battles. We'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always introduce myself because we're on the Internet and a lot of people haven't seen me before. I've got a title on the board. How I came to realize that Christmas is pagan. I came to realize it by reading the Bible. The first time I realized there was something wrong with Christmas, I was a little boy. 
I was probably about seven, six or seven, when my mom and dad told me that Santa Claus was not real, that he was, that it was our father that was given the gifts. I know that some people can't believe this, but it went through my mind as a six and seven year old, why would mom and daddy lie to me like this? I don't understand that. If he isn't real, why would they say that he was? They were lying. Of course, the whole world was lying to the kids. The way this thing came about in my life, it was a process of learning. When I was 12 years old, this was 1951. I remember it very vividly. I've told this story before, but this is where I began to, I had suspected something from about six and seven that something was wrong with this thing called Christmas. I would not be agreeable if I couldn't figure it out. I remember one time I was four and a half years old. I can remember because we lived on Bird Street just off Sylvania Avenue in Fort Worth, Texas. And this was about 1944. I was just a little kid. And I couldn't be fooled then. I didn't know that I was being realistic. But we would come home on a Christmas Eve. And, and my father said to my older brother Clyde. Clyde was about six. He said, there goes Santa Claus on the other street over there. Clyde says, I see him. I see him. And I said, I can't see him. Where is he? And I'm a little kid saying, I don't see him. I would not be conned by an older person, even at four and five years old. Well, the next thing that happened, I was 12. We lived at 3307 Grover Street in Fort Worth. That was a little bitty houses they built after the war so that these... Uh, uh, veterans could buy homes. It was about seven, 750 square feet houses. And I remember it had a living room, a kitchen, two bedrooms, and there were six of us lived in about 750 square feet. And I remember one day that Clyde came home, my older brother, and said, Bill Hunter said they bought a television. We said, what's that? We didn't know what a television was. He said, it's something, it's like a movie in a house. And we didn't know what that was. We'd never seen or heard of one. Well, Daddy went out, and he bought a little bitty TV screen, an eight-inch screen like that, about like that. Great big box like this. Rabbit ears. All we could get was NBC and CBS. ABC was fledgling. It had not developed yet. There certainly wasn't any cable. Forget that. So we got two, two stations. We watched everything. We watched Howdy Doody, if you can remember that. We watched, that was a little kid's show. We watched everything. We just turned the TV on to watch the test pattern, the Indian head test pattern. We'd look at that. Like, golly, wow, isn't that something? And we would turn all the lights out where it would be dark except for that. We didn't know it was better to have a light on. And we'd watch everything. We'd watch uh, I Love Lucy on Friday night. That's the year that she started on TV. It was 1951. We'd watch wrestling. I think it was on Tuesday night. And we watched the Midnight Mass because we had nothing else to do on Christmas Eve. And I'm sitting there. My, I didn't know I was analyzing till I grew up, but I was always analyzing as a kid. And I was watching the Pope, and I thought, Christmas, Christ Mass, is that what that means? Christ. I'm sitting there just analyzing this. Christ Mass. Is that what Christmas means? And I thought, St. Nicholas, I think that's another name for Santa Claus. I found out later that they called him, he was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop, and then he went to Holland and they became, 
he became Santa Claus. He became Father Christmas in England. And then when it moved to America, he became Santa Claus. And I thought he's a Roman Catholic priest or something. I found out he was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. You can look up St. Nicholas in the McClinican Strong and it's corrupt to the core. In fact, I've got a picture of St. Nicholas. This is the this is the Roman Catholic St. Nicholas, if I can get it going. See if I can get it here. Hold on. Oops, there it is. That's St. Nicholas, the Roman Catholic St. Nicholas. He's got a tonsure. This tonsure here is where they shave their heads in a circle to depict the sun. The halo is the sun, is a type of the sun god. He's got his foot upon the world. It was said that he, when he prayed, that he could... He knew he knew all things. He was omniscient, that he was omnipotent, all-powerful. He could actually raise the dead. He supposedly raised some, these young men, three of them had been killed and cut up in pieces and put in a pickle barrel. And he come along and raised them up out of the dead from that pickle barrel. And they came back alive. You believe that? He was supposed to have all the characters of Christ, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. That's why he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. And because he gave gifts to children, some of the scholars say he was a pedophile. Now, a little bit about St. Nicholas. Back to my story. Daddy went out and got that TV. And I knew something wasn't right about it. I, from that, I never told my family. I never told Janice or Dean or Clyde or Mom and Daddy. And I always felt real uncomfortable when Christmas came. The worst thing about Christmas to me that I remember was it oppressed the poor. It oppressed us, and we were poor. Oh, and Daddy was always pastoring a little Baptist church somewhere outside of town, and they'd be running 25 or 30 people. Mama would come to us from the time we were 11, 12, 13, 14, and she'd say, kids, there won't be any Christmas this year. Your daddy don't have any money. That didn't bother me because I was always a sacker in a grocery store or I had paper routes and I could make my money. I bought every stitch of clothing from the time that I was 12 years old to this day. Nobody ever bought me clothes or gave me money for spending money. I did that all myself. I don't mean that to boast. I've got a good work ethic. Anyway, I kept on and I started wanting to study the Bible. I got to be about 17, and by 1956, I began to pray, Lord, help me to learn the Bible. My father was a very shallow Bible teacher. He really didn't know much about it. He would read things, and he would say the wrong things about the wrong verses. I didn't know that till I grew older and studied the Bible. He was always talking about accept Christ as your personal Savior. I found that that's not true that you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He was always preaching the sinner's prayer for salvation. And I found out later when I studied the Bible, that wasn't true. I don't know where my father went when he died. He had a terrible temper. He lost his temper all day long, everywhere he went. I believe he was spoiled rotten. I told him one day, I said, you were a brat when you're coming up. I found out from my grandmother, I found out from one of my aunts that my grandmother fed my father breakfast in bed till he was 18 years old. He was the youngest of, thir youngest of 13, and she wouldn't let anybody touch baby Harless. So he grew up rotten to the core. And I don't know why he started preaching, but he did. 
My family knows he was that way. Everybody that knew him knew he was that way. Well, what the way this thing developed, I began to pray, Lord, help me find the truth. And I began to try to read the Bible. Because I didn't know where to read, I'd read a while in Genesis and I'd quit. I'd read a while in John and I'd quit. I'd read some in Matthew and I'd quit. I read some in the Old Testament, I'd quit. And I got to reading, and as I would read, things began to fit together, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I began to see all those gods that Israel went after, Baal and the grove. I began to see these, I began to see Baal and the grove and grove. And then I began to see all these other gods that Israel went after, Molech, Moloch, and their forms are the same word, Milcom, a form of these. And then I started wanting to find out who they were, Shemosh. And I began to get any kind of dictionaries or encyclopedias and search out who were these gods. And this began to bother me so bad uh, in my late 30s. I began to want to know who are these gods that Israel's going after. And I began to run across the fact that the Baal was the sun god. And I kind of put that together with, I would see these movies like Hercules movies. Uh, Steve Reeves was a bodybuilder and a Mr. America back in the early 50s. And he would be acting in one of these movies on Saturday on TV in black and white back then. And... I would, I would see, they would call him the child of the sun or the sun god. And I started connecting that with the fact that Baal was the sun god. He was represented by the fire. I didn't get all of this from one spot. And then I began to look at the grove. And the grove, as I saw her, she was Venus, Venus. And I got real bent out of shape. I didn't know what to do with it. I found out that Baal was the same thing as Hercules. When you look up Hercules in this McClinic and Strong, if you look, I don't just look up Baal. I look up their counterpart. And I looked up Hercules, and it will tell you that's the Tyrian Baal. What do you mean by Tyre? Tyre is right above Israel. Right above Israel. I'm doing a lot of evaluating as I go along, as I'm thinking. My mind is just buzzing constantly. And Tyre is right above Israel. That's what we call Lebanon. And that's where that's where Jezebel's father was, Ethbaal. I can't tell you all the thinking that I put together from every kind of area I could see. And that's where Jezebel married Ahab of northern Israel and brought her father's gods, Baal and the grove, down into Israel, and I'm going to talk about them. Well, this was bothering me, Shemosh and Molech and Baal and the Grove. And then I found out, when I got a concordance, started studying concordance, I've got a paper, and this is, I even just clipped out a lot of the gods that Israel was serving and they were serving Baal. And when it says Balaam, B-A-A-L-I-M, I-M is plural. 
it means there's B A A L I M or I Y M. That's always plural in the Hebrew. And then they were serving the grove, and we have the groves, and then they were serving Moloch and Milcom and Malcolm and Ashtaroth. And I got to looking at that A S H T O R E T H. Ashtaroth, when it's spelled with an E, it's plural, and when it's spelled with an O, it's singular. And the Bible says that Israel had a God of Baal on every street. So they had them everywhere. And I got to saying, I got to find out about this. I had traveled on the road preaching and singing gospel music with my own trio. And I, I came to a place... I had gone through Washington, D.C., and there was a fellow that come out to all of our singings every time we'd go there, and he went to Washington Bible Institute. He believed in predestination. He told me they believed in predestination. So about this time, I said, I need to call up to Washington Bible Institute. This was a process of my learning. And I called up there and talked to the secretary and said, I want to talk to the man who is your top history teacher there. She gave me a number. I called him and I said, sir, I'm just a little preacher down here in Hendersonville, Tennessee. And I've been studying these gods that Israel was going after and I believe we're involved in Roman and Greek God worship with this thing called Christmas. And he simply said to me, well, what you need, you need two things. Hey, this is what this professor recommended to me. He said, you need the McClinic and Strong Cyclopedia of Biblical Ecclesiastical Theological Literature, and you need a book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And he said, That's, that'll get you started. I said, thank you very much. He didn't defend anything. Evidently, he believed exactly what I was looking for. This is, without a doubt, has more information in it about sun worship, this Two Babylons, than any book I have ever read. It has got tremendous amount. Now, what really got me to going on this, I want to share it with you. My mind has been thinking all these years, whether I was looking at a movie about the child of the sun, and that was, and I noticed that Steve Reeves, when he was playing Hercules, he would be a god and a man. Well, that worked into my thinking, God-men. A God-man. God, the God-men started in the garden. These were men, but they were gods. God is the word Elohim in the, in the Greek, E-L-O-H-I-Y-M. In the Greek... And it is the word theos, excuse me, Elohim in the Hebrew, theos in the Greek. It means a judge. They both mean the same thing, a judge or a magistrate. When, Eve's, when God says, thou shalt not, she said, I'll be the judge of that. She said, I'll be the judge of that. So she became a God-man. Now, God-men were called D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S, demones. They were inferior gods. They didn't have the same position. I've studied this in great detail. They didn't have the same position that these gods had as the men as the men in the pantheon of gods. Pantheon, 
Pantheon comes from the word pan. Pan means all. When you pan an audience, you run the camera over the whole audience. Now, what I'm wanting to do is show you, I'm showing you how my mind has been thinking all these years. I didn't start thinking about this a few years ago. I've been thinking about this since I was about seven when I began to realize mom and daddy lied to me about Santa Claus. And why would they do that? Well, because everybody else is doing it. Now, what I was talking about, about, I was talking about how I got involved in understanding that Christmas is pagan. I was reading about all these gods in the Bible, and I want to review some of this with you so you'll see what I was thinking. And you have to stop. A lot of these things, these thoughts, overlap in my mind. I can't know if, I don't know if you can understand that. But they overlap in my mind. Whenever I'm saying that the gods of Israel, notice I put little g, the gods of Israel, were equal. They were equal to the gods that Constantine brought into the church, into church. And I keep saying, there is a map on the internet. There, goodbye, St. Nicholas of Myra. All right. <laughs> Got to get rid of you. You're such a corrupt person. Now, get back to my favorite map here. I keep saying this. This is why we know. This is why we know that Constantine, what he did, he had a fear of two things, of the Christians were multiplying at breakneck speed all over his, his world that he was ruling. He was ruling in Constantinople, and then they call, that's Istanbul now, uh, like the old Four Lad song said. He wanted to rule the whole world, so he comes over here to conquer the Western Empire, where Maxentius rules there, Maxen, Maxentius. And he comes over here, and as he's about to go into the, the city of Rome, there's a bridge there. It's called the Malvian Bridge. And right before he crosses the Malvian Bridge and goes into Rome, he says he saw a cross in the sky. And he hears a voice that says, go and conquer by this cross. God would not command anyone to go to war for him. He said, if my kingdom were this world, then would my servants fight. It's not of this world. Well, he had a man that traveled with him. His name was Lactanius. Lactanius was one of the most scholarly men alive in the world in that day and time. He was brilliant. Well, if you were ruler of the world, you're ruler of the Eastern and the Western Empire, you could hire anybody you want to hire to be your son's tutor. And that's what Lactanius was. Lactanius said he did not see a cross in the sky, said he saw this. In the Greek, since Constantine was a Greek, when you look at something that looks like an X, it's not. It's a key, a CH. What he did, he took that, that key and added the Greek R to it. He put that R, this is an R, 
and that is the labrum of Constantine, and you see that on all of the vestments of the Roman Catholic Pope. If you're up midnight uh, this uh, coming Christmas, watch the Mass, and you'll see this labrum of Constantine on the Mass. He was, he was afraid of losing the empire, to all these Huns and Vandals and Goths and Visigoths and all these Burgundians, these Saxons, these were wild people. They were not controlled by anybody. They were rampaging across the European continent. The, the Caesars only ruled around the Mediterranean Sea. When the beast rises up out of the sea, it's talking about the Mediterranean. The beast is going to be a worldwide system at the end of time. Now, I'm trying to get, let me say one thing that I've said over and over. I hope you're getting a hold of this. The gods that Israel served from the time they became a nation under kings well, actually, it started under Judges. When they were under Judges for about 390 years, they were under kings for approximately 510 years from 1 Samuel to end of Second Chronicles. First and Second Samuel... First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. The Jews call that one book. They called it the Book of the Kings. Well, they had come out of 40 years in the wilderness before they come to Joshua. Most people don't know what these people were. Joshua took the place of Moses because Moses was not allowed to go in the promised land because in Numbers, the 20th chapter, God told Moses to speak to the rock and he got mad at the people because they were upset because they didn't have any water and Moses got mad and struck the rock twice. God says, just for that, you don't go into the promised land. And Joshua took his place. So when Joshua takes his place, he goes into the promised land. Joshua's, Joshua's main job, I've been reading on this for a long time. Joshua's main job, when they went into the promised land, they would wandered down here south of Israel is the wilderness. South of Israel. They wandered in this wilderness right here. See that little B-shaped land? That's the wilderness. They wandered in that for 40 years. And then they come up just north of the Dead Sea and cross the Jordan River and go in to possess the land that had been given to Abraham about 600 years before. Joshua's job, his main purpose, was to go into the land and conquer these lands. While they had been gone out of this land, out of this land, the pagans had come in and taken it over. The uh, Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Leucocytes, all of them, they'd come in and taken over this land. Jo Joshua's job was to split the land up assign it to the sons of Jacob. Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of Joseph. His tribe was split into two. And then there's Dan and Gad and Reuben and Judah and Simeon and Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali. These are all sons of Jacob. You can find them you can find them in the 29th and the 30th chapters of Genesis being born by their mothers. So Joshua's job was going there and to attack Jericho and to attack Ai and put these people in submission. They were told, Joshua was told, drive out the pagans. I don't want you in there with them. 
this has to do with all my reading of the Bible from the time I was 17. And he's, and they go in, and when you read the first and second chapters of Judges, God said, none of those people, none, he said, Ephraim did not drive them out, that Benjamin didn't drive them out, Manasseh didn't drive them out. They let them stay in the land and they lived with them. They started marrying them and they were sun and tree worshipers. How in the world you, they could do that? God says, I brought you out of Egypt. You don't even care. So I'm talking about what I'm going to do is get to these people when they come into the land. He says here in the, you can turn with me to the book of Judges. The first, not the first I saw, in the book of Numbers, as they were coming, as they were wandering through the wilderness. Let me put this on the board. In the book of Numbers, as they're coming through the wilderness, I've told you about the wilderness they were in the wilderness for 40 years. If this is Israel, Israel is a long, skinny country. It's less than the size of New Jersey. It doesn't even have the square miles they have in New Jersey. Above Israel is what we call Lebanon. That's ancient Tyre and Sidon. And it, and it was ancient Phoenicia before that. Phoenicia. That's they brought that those gods down into Israel. And they have married Jezebel and she brought her gods down. I don't know why I put that line up there. It went down about like this. And they were over here in Egypt. This is the Mediterranean Sea. They were in Egypt. They were in Egypt for four hundred years. Moses brings them out and they go, they cross the Red Sea here. God opens the Red Sea. He drowns Pharaoh's armies in the Red Sea and they come out here and they go down to Mount Sinai. He gives Moses the law. They wander or go up here to Kadesh Barnea and God tells them to go in and to spy out that land. And they go in and spy the land for 40 days. And they find out that there are giants in the land. Giants. And those giants were, were uh, they were huge men, tall, like nine foot six. They were in all probability Goliath's ancestors. And uh, that was called the land of Anak. Later on, it was called the land of the Philistines. And then today, it's called the Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip. Well, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, a day for every year, and they came back and told Moses, we can't go in there, those are giants. God says, just for that, I'm going to make you one in the wilderness till I kill off everybody that was that was 20 years older, older as of Kadesh Barnea. That's because 20 was the was draft age in Israel. You had to be 20 to serve in the army. So we killed off everybody. They come up here. They come up here, and they go through the land of Moab. Well, like, more like this. Go through the land of Moab, and while they're coming through the land of Moab, they call, go through a city called Baal Peor. Baal Peor was their god, so they pick up that god, and they come up here just north of the Dead Sea, and they cross the Jordan River, and they go in to repossess the land, this is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1400 
B.C. Somewhere in that neighborhood. And that land was given to Abraham around 2100 B.C. Those are just approximate dates. So they're going back to repossess the land. They're supposed to drive out the pagans, and they don't. And I, and I decide to get into this book and find out what it is they're doing. This is actually the way I found out that Christmas was pagan. I kept studying about these gods I kept going after. And when I've said this before, Revelation 17 and 5 says, Babylon, Babylon was the mother. She mothered all Harlotry. If she mothered all harlotry, the mother of all harlotry was Babylon, and she began her reign in Genesis 11 and 4. That's where she started. So all Idolatry, the word harlotry just means idolatry. It's the word P-O-R-N-E, porne. When you think of porn, you think of naked men and women. It's more than that. It's idolatry. The word means idolatry, I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. Idololatria comes from ido. And la truo, it means to serve la truo, what you see. So what mothered all idolatry was Babylon. And she was founded on this doctrine. Let us make us a name. All idolatry comes from the same source in Genesis 11 and 4. All these were tree worshipers. If all idolatry comes from one source, they all have, they all have something in common. They worship the same gods, the fire and the tree. That's all of them. All of these Huns and Vandals and Goths and Visigoths that was going to overthrow Rome and Constantine believed they were going to overthrow. He did not know how to handle them. All of the emperors had been having trouble for the previous 200 years believing these were wild people. They wasn't controlled by nothing. They didn't have laws. They just got on the top of a... they get on a horseback, the, the Visigoths would and rush, run into a town just shooting arrows and killing everything in sight. That's the same thing that Israel was worshiping for 500 years. We know that's the same thing because all idolatry comes out of the same source. Well, Israel goes after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech and the gods of Egypt, Venus and, and uh, Isis and Osiris, all the gods of Egypt, they served the gods of the Syrians, Remen. They served the gods of everybody around them. They were going after the gods of... Why God would even hold on to them? Why? He said, well, I loved them. I picked them out. I didn't choose them because they were the greatest of people. They were the smallest. So everything... So when you read the Bible... And you read Israel's going after anybody in the world. Everybody's doing it to make themselves a name. The word name, Shem, means authority. Isn't that what these hordes were rampaging across Europe? They want to be the authority over everybody else and rule everybody? That's not any different than Napoleon. That's not any different than people who want to rule in this world. If some guy owns a business and he wants to rule in the business 
He'll do anything to run anybody else out of it. That's making oneself a name. That's the whole point about it all. Now, what I want us to do is to look at what I was reading through the years. What made me start questioning? What made me call that professor? I noticed that in this first chapter of Judges, in Judges, the first chapter, God tells Israel, throw these people out. I gave the land to Abraham. They didn't pay any attention. In fact, when they come into the land, and God told them to drive them out, verse 21 of chapter 1, the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. You don't know how important these verses are. Neither, verse 27, neither did Manasseh, that firstborn of Joseph, drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen. And her towns are North Tanakh. Her towns are the inhabitants of Dor. Then verse 29, neither did Ephraim, the secondborn son of Joseph, drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nehalal, but the Canaanites dwelt with Israel. God said, drive them out and don't marry them, but they did. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Achor. Verse 31, 33, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Bashemesh. And you get down here into chapter th chapter 2. They kept all those pagans with them. And they married them and started worshiping their gods. And we're up to this point where he says, verse 1 of chapter 2. I was reading this as a young man. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go out of Egypt and have brought you into this land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Don't you break it with me, but they did. Now, comes time, Joshua brings them into the land. Comes time for Joshua to die. Joshua was making sure that they do the things that God says. In verse 8, chapter 2, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. And being a hundred and ten years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in ten Nathares, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaosh. And also all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and there rose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel by delivering them out of 400 years in bondage and delivering from all their enemies and killing all their enemies. And the children of Israel did evil. As soon as the leader dies, they go right straight back to Baal in the grove and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was a generic term for all the female deities. In the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. I am means plural. All the Baal gods. And they forsook the Lord their God, their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. They followed the gods of the people of the land around them because they didn't drive them out. Great day, Israel. And bowed themselves unto them to provoke the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Golly, Israel, what are you thinking of? What is America thinking of? And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, 
and he delivered them in the hand of the spoilers that spoiled them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Simply for going after other gods. Now you get on down to the next chapter. These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel, to put them in the fire, to make them know who they were. Even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them to war. They didn't know nothing about warring. They've been in Egypt for 400 years. They don't know how to fight. So he's going to teach them to war by putting them under the tutorage of these enemies of theirs. Here's the, here's the enemies that's going to teach them to war. Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Zidonians, the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Belharmon unto the entering end of Hamath. And look down here in verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. They were all sun and tree worshippers. And they took their daughters to be their wives. God says, don't do that. If you take their daughters, the women will stay at home, teach your children sun and tree worship, and you'll be out in the field working, and your kids won't know the truth. Do you think America's doing that? Are they going off and letting their kids go be wild about not teaching them truth and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods? Baal, Grove, Shema, Shmolek, all the gods they went, Israel went after. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the grove. Can you see why I was so inquisitive about who that was? I come to find out it was the same gods of Christmas later on, the same ones. They all had one thing in common. Their mother was Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And God's doing all this to destroy Israel. So they begin to cry out, God, give us, save us. He turns them over to their enemies. So God calls one to be their deliverer, Othniel. He's down in verse 9. Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb, Caleb's younger brother, the main reason for that is Caleb was the only one, he and, he and Joshua were the only two that were allowed to enter into the promised land that had been over 20 years old as of Kadesh Barnea. Because they said, Caleb and Joshua said, we'll go in and fight those giants. God says, just for that, they're the only two that will live as of Kadesh Barnea. All the rest of you are going to die. I'll have you wander in the wilderness for 40 years till I kill off all believers. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon Othniel, and he judged Israel, went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushay-Rithathim, king of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between the rivers, between the Tigris, and the Euphrates River, that's in what we call Iraq. That was in Iraq. And the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel the son of Canaan died, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. What are you people thinking about? Can you believe that they're doing this? It's just unbelievable. I want to read you some more places where then we get on in. The, these are the things that was puzzling me as a young man. Where in the world are these 
What in the world is Israel doing? What is America doing? It's like they don't care. And then you get into that next chapter. That second chapter. Or get into the third chapter. And God sends Ehud. Ehud's a left-handed man. And he kills this wicked man who's an overweight man, plunges a dagger into him, and the Bible says the dirt comes out. And he he's a, he's a wicked king of Moab. And he's very evil. So God kills him and he worships these sun and tree gods. And then I've kind of worked my way up to this next chapter. Shamgar comes along and he's a he's a uh, one of the judges. Then Deborah's the next judge. And then you get over here into Gideon. And Gideon is he's a judge of Israel. And as soon as Deborah dies, verse 1, chapter 6, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. So the Midianites start beating up Israel. And then God goes to this one Israelite and tells him, I want you to go through all the land and destroy all the gods of Baal. And this man's name is Gideon. And the angel of the Lord goes to him in verse 12 of chapter 6. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. He's going, are you talking to me? I'm just a dirt farmer. <laughs> I'm not a mighty man of valor. He was just a farmer. So Gideon goes through all the land. Kill, and then if you noticed, it doesn't even say that Baal has come into the land. It just tells you it's there and he wants Gideon to go destroy it. So he goes through the land, wipes out all the Baal worship in Israel. And the men of Israel get upset at Gideon and say, we need to go and kill him. Uh, how can Israel be defending their Baal gods when they're dead gods? And the men of the city, verse 30, the men of the city said unto Joash, Joash was the father of Gideon. Bring out thy son Gideon, that we may die, that he may die, because he's cast down the altar of Baal, and we're Israelites, and we serve Baal. Sometimes it don't even tell you that Israel's going to back to Baal. It just tells you when he calls somebody to drive out Baal gods. Baal is nothing but Hercules that they're serving. And because he hath cut down the grove that was by it, he cut down the tree goddess. And Joash, the father of Gideon, said to the people that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Now the word plead is the word rube, R-U-W-B. That might be familiar to some of you, R-U-W-B. Rube is a word that they use in circuses. If you're uh, in a circus and you're trying to throw balls at something and win a prize and you start fighting the guy that's in that little cubicle and and they realize that you're trying to start something, they will holler, Rube! That means fight! That's this word right here. They said, if, he, if Baal is a god, 
Let him fight for himself. This is what Joash, this is what Joash, the father of Gideon, said to him. Let him fight his own battles. Of course, he's not a god. He's a dead god. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbaal. Jerubbaal means let him fight Baal for himself. Then you get into seventh chapter. Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, and all the people, God says, I want you to be my leader, Gideon, when you go against the Midianites. The Midianites were Baal worshippers too. This just puzzled me all my life. How, how can they be doing this? And of course, Gideon goes against the Midianites. And he goes against them with 300 people. Now, get this. There's a hundred, there's over 120,000 Midianites. And Gideon goes against them with 300 men. Remember God's promise, if you're obedient to me, you can go against your enemy one way and they'll flee seven ways. What happens? God says, I don't want you getting any credit for what I'm doing, Gideon. So he tells Gideon in that seventh chapter, The Lord said unto Gideon, verse 2, the people that are with thee are too many, Gideon. I don't want you having credit for winning. For me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. I don't want Israel to be able to say that. Now therefore, go to proclaim the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. So Gideon says, everybody that's afraid and you don't want to fight the Midianites, you can leave right now. 20,000 left. That left 10,000. And God says, that's still too many. <laughs> You'll think that you did all this yourself. And you don't. So he says to Gideon, the Lord says to Gideon, the people are yet too many. 10,000 against 120,000. I need the odds to be greater than that. So he says, I want everyone, when you go down to this stream. So he brought them down the people to, he brought the people down to water in verse 5. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by, them, by himself. And likewise, everyone that boweth down, you know what this is all about? Getting rid of the gods in your life. And him that bowed down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth like this. He said, they were 300 men. He said, that's all I want you to take. Whoo wee and the Midianites are covering the land. I just want 300, that's all. Boy. So God tells Gideon, I want you to, let's look up here in verse five, 15. It was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped 
and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered unto your hand the host of Midian. You're going to win with 300 people. (coughs) And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. This is going to be your weapon. No spears. It's going to be all of me, God said. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. When I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow your trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp and beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. It scared them to death. This was the miracle of God working. And the 300 men blew the trumpets. And the Lord said, every man's sword against his fellow. They turned their swords on each other and killed one another because that's the way God wanted it so that Israel couldn't take any credit and Gideon couldn't take any credit either. You see, when you're obedient to God, he'll work miracles you can't understand. And that's what he did here. And read verse 10 of verse chapter 8. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Kalkar and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, and all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east. And there fell an hundred and twenty thousand men of the Midianites that drew the sword, simply because they blew trumpets broke their broke their pictures, made a loud noise, and said, This is the sword of the Lord and get in. And you know what God's doing this for? To get Israel about out of their God worship. Now, turn over to chapter ten. Gideon had a son, his name was Abimelech. Abimelech was a rascal. He wanted to be, the. they had offered to make Gideon king of Israel. He said, I'm not going to do that. But Abimelech, his son, as soon as Gideon dies, he said, you can make me king. And Abimelech had all of his brothers killed. And when he had his brothers killed, it left him alone. So he says, you can make me king. And they made him their leader. And Abimelech kept going to battle with the people. And he got into war with them. And Abimelech being as evil as he was in chapter 9 and verse 52, Abimelech came into the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of millstone. That was a that was a volcano stone. It was real light. She used it as a weapon, a woman did. Upon Abimelech's head, verse fifty three, and it 
and all to break his skull. Boy, Abimelech got bit out of shape at this. One thing you didn't want, you didn't want to go into battle and have a woman kill you. We don't want it said that a woman ever killed me. Somebody run me through with a sword. That's what Abimelech said. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said, Draw thy sword and kill me. That men say not of me, a woman slew him, and his young man thrust him through, and Abimelech died. This, you know what this is all about? Israel, Israel not driving out the pagans and marrying them and worshiping their gods. It's about that. It's all about that very thing. Then in chapter 10, I'll just read to you a little bit about this. Some of these judges, they don't say much about. They give you a list of them right here. Abimelech, verse 1 of chapter 10. Abimelech there arose to defend Israel. After, after Abimelech rose, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shammar and Mount Ephraim, and he judged Israel twenty and three years and died. That's all that you got to say about Tola. And was buried in Shamir, and after him arose Jair of Gilead, and judged Israel twenty and two years, and he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities which were called Havath Jair unto this day which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died. That's all I got to say about Jair, just a couple of verses. And was buried in Cammon. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth. You Can you see why I was so puzzled as what this was? This was the same thing that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. And God is killing them right and left. And keep. Do you think the United States is doing any different than they're doing? They're going after Baal. And, well, we don't have Baal. Do you have your cars and your houses and your things and your stuff? Do you have that? Is that what you go after? Is that what America's going after? Are they going after, let us make us a name? They're going after Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab. Moab served Shemosh. Moab was southern, what we call southern Jordan. And they served Shemosh. And the Bible says here that Israel is going after Shemosh. It says the gods of Moab, that is the god of Moab. Shemesh, H-A-E-M-E-S-H, is the word son in the Hebrew. They were going after the child of the sun. Good grief, Israel. They're going after the gods of Zidon. That was Baal in the grove. They didn't wait till they became a nation to go after Bell in the grove. They're going after them right here. The sun god and the tree goddess. And the gods of the children of Ammon. Ammon was northern Jordan and they served Moloch. Israel not only went after Moloch, they built fires for Moloch in the valley of Tophet. God. Can you believe that? If this is Israel, it's a long, and this is Jerusalem here. Israel, this is the land of Ammon up here. Here's the land of Moab, this is the land of Ammon. And the Ammon, they sold Moloch, M O L O C H, or Molech, however you want to pronounce it. And just south of Jerusalem in the valley of Tophet, they had fires, eternal fires, to Moloch in Jerusalem. 
Israel was was corrupted by the gods that were around them, the gods of Egypt, the gods of, of Syria, the gods of, of Tyre and Sidon, uh, Baal and the Grove. They were going after the gods of Egypt. They were going after the fire gods of Moab, Shemosh, and the gods of Ammon. They were going after the gods of Egypt. Of, of Babylon over here on the Euphrates River. Israel was nuts. They were crazy. They couldn't think rational. Couldn't they even stop and remember how they'd been attacked before and just been crushed under the hands of these people? It's like they'd forget from one judge to the other. Man, can you believe that? And they forsook God and went after the gods of Syria. That's Remen. That's a, couldn't even get into Remen. So much to it. And the gods of the Philistines. Dagon. They were serving Dagon. Dagon was a fish god. And he was a sun god. Dagon comes from dog, which is the word fish in the Hebrew they just you, you can't believe that Israel keeps doing this and then in that I could read the whole chapter but I won't in verse 7 of chapter 10 the anger of God was hot against Israel why would God be hot against Israel and not hot against America why? I believe God is hot against America. I believe we're going down and we're going to hit the bottom like we're, we're on some train going down a hill and hitting it as hard as we can. I believe America is going broke. If God will do this to Israel, why would he let America alone? America's not. America is not a Christian nation. It never has been. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin were not Christians. They said they weren't. They were self-avowed deists. A deist believes in a deity. A deity is a God. They said there was a God that spun all this universe out there into space and then told us to take care of it. That's what a deity is. Just, it's insane what has been going on. When you go to this 11th chapter, Israel gets in such trouble again. They're, they're getting in trouble again, and every time they get in trouble, they start screaming, God help us! Give us a leader! So God says, I'll give you another leader. It'll be somebody you don't like. And he appoints a man named Jephthah. Verse 1, chapter 11. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. He had one problem. He was the son of a harlot. <laughs> and they don't like illegitimate children, especially of a harlot. But boy, he was a fighter. He was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's son grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, You'll not inherit our father's house, for you are the son of a strange woman, a harlot. And Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon, northern Jordan, if this is, this is northern Jordan, the land of Ammon right here. The children of Ammon made war against Israel. You had to have a fierce leader to be able to win. 
these generals could put things together and put an army together that could win. They didn't want the super leader to die. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. We've got to get us our Savior. Jephthah's the only thing that can save us. And they said unto Jephthah, come and be our captain after we threw you out for being an illegitimate son of a harlot. That we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? Why are you come to me now when you're in distress? Because we need you to deliver us. I like one of the sayings in Mary's book. It says, it said, uh, you're never betrayed by an enemy. <laughs> you know what he's saying? You're never betrayed by an enemy because it's not betrayal if your enemy don't like you. You can only be betrayed by a friend. That's what these guys are doing. They betrayed him, said, now we need you. He goes to battle. He wins the wars against the enemy. And then he steps down. And they go right back to their old tricks. Israel doesn't stop. He's got another list of a few of the of the judges in chapter 12 and verse well let me read here verse 7 Jephthah judged Israel six years then died Jephthah the Gileadite was buried in one of the cities of Gilead and after Jephthah, after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he had sent abroad and took and 30 daughters from abroad and from his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan. He didn't have much to say about him. And was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon a Zebulonite, you can see where the land of Zebulun is, right at the top, that purple spot up there on the left. He was a Zebulonite, and Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Agilon, the country of Zebulun. And after him, Abdon, the son of Halil, a parent the night, judged Israel, and he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode three score and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Halil, the Parathonite, died. They all died. Didn't have much to say about him. And then, chapter 13, enter Samson the judge of Israel. Well, his mother was barren. She ain't have kids, and God visits her. And his father, Manoah, says, you're going to have a son, and he'll be a Nazarite. Nazarite doesn't eat any strong meat. He doesn't drink any wine. His hair stays long. He lets his hair grow for the rest of his life. And Samson did all these things. And he has these run-ins with the, the Philistines. And they are still going, and Israel is under Philistine oppression because they don't care about serving God. And the last thing... Samson does. He kills 
30 Philistines one day just before supper just because because they raped his wife. And then he goes against them and he, of course, he falls into the hands of Delilah. She says, oh, tell me what, the, what your strength is. Well, his strength was in his vow as a Nazarite that his hair would never be cut. And she kept pleading with him. He said, well, if you'll tie me it's real tight with bonds that have never been tied or broken before, he said, I'll lose my strength. So she had him tied up and called. I don't know why he could. She says, okay, come in, Philistines. I got him bound. He breaks loose. And she keeps on trying to get him to tell his secret. Finally, as wily as she is, he breaks down and tells her, my hair can't be cut. I have the valvanizer right. She has his hair cut. The Philistines fall upon him and they tie him between two big pillars of stone and he says, God, give me one more time to have strength. And he pushes those stone pillars down. He kills more Philistines in his death than he'd killed all of his lifetime. And Israel was still under the rule of people who were serving Baal in the grove. Can you see why I'm puzzled by this reading through the Bible as a young man? Then you get, then Israel, they get into Israel. How much time do I have, Mike? They get into Israel. And they don't say that Baal in the grove has brought been brought into Israel. But when you get into that seventh chapter of First Samuel, Samuel is the prophet of God. And he is a special man of God. His mother was Hannah, and she was barren. And she told God, if you'll give me a son, I'll dedicate him to you when I wean him. Well, she bare a son, called his name Samuel. <laughs> what a man of God. I believe he was God's 13th judge. And he's out to straighten Israel out. Well, several things happen up to that 7th chapter. But I'm going to read something to you in the 7th chapter. Verse 3. Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods. It doesn't say they entered Israel, but evidently they've come back. Because they're worshiping Ashtaroth, Put away Ashtaroth, the female tree deities from you. That puzzled me over and over when I'd read it. They kept going back to other gods, just like America. Except the gods in America are your cars, your houses, your things, your stuff, your expensive jewelry, your... It seems like that's all people want. Your timeshares, your vacations, your money, your things, your stuff. He says, put away the... They have evidently entered because he's saying they need to be put away from you. The Asteroth from among you, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel put away Balaam and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth is the female. It's a generic term for all the female deities. And serve the, the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord, that God will break your heart and turn you away.
now. All through First and Second Samuel, the next chapter, the eighth chapter, that's when the people, that's when the people say, Samuel's got two wild sons, Joel and Abia. Joel was a common name back then. That's not the Joel book of Joel. Joel and Abia, and they were wicked. They took bribes in the temple. They did things that they wasn't supposed to do. So Israel says, give us a king. And God says, I'll give you a king, and it won't be one you like. He's going to be from the wrong tribe. I'm going to have his heart turn away from you. And that's what happens in that 11th through the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel. And he, he, God gives them Saul. Saul is out of the tribe of Benjamin. The king has to come out of Judah. So God has to turn away from Saul. And he does that in that 15th chapter. He says, the kingdom is no longer yours. I've appointed a man in the tribe of Bethlehem, Judah. His name is David. He will be my king. Now, I'm simply trying to show you and all the way through the rest of the book, Saul is trying to kill David because he thinks David becoming king over Israel is David's idea. It's not David's idea. It's God's idea. He's the one who sent Samuel down to southern Judah and says, go to the house of, it, go to the house of Jesse, the, Beth, the Bethlehemite. I've chosen a, me, a king among his sons to be the king. God did the choosing. Well, Saul thinks it was David that did it. It was God that chose David. And so Saul takes off after David in the 19th. Actually, he starts trying to kill him in the 18th chapter. In the 17th chapter, that's where he goes out and kills Goliath. And all the women... All the women are shouting as David comes into the city, Saul hath killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands, and uh, Saul would, oh, oh, I'll kill him. Jealousy was raging in Saul because David went out and killed this champion of the Philistines, and the women loved it. It was like he was a rock star. All these girls go, hey, David. <laughs> so Saul goes out to kill David. The first thing he does, he grabs a javelin. I'm not talking about an old car. Grabs a javelin, throws it at David and misses him. He did that several times. He did that because the women are shouting what they're shouting. And then he tells David, I'm going to send you what I want you to do. I want you to be head of my bodyguard. Now, it wasn't that David wasn't capable of being in the army of Saul. He wasn't old enough. He had to have been around 18. You had to be 20 to be in the army. But David said, I've gone out and I've killed a bear with this club. I killed a lion with this sling and I can kill that giant. He can't get to me. Well, Saul says, I want you to go and get a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. You're going to be ahead of my bodyguard. A hundred, no, not a thousand, a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. When he said a hundred foreskins, he's not talking about circumcising them. He's talking about cutting off all their genitals. Why? Because that way they can't mount up, they can't have any children to come and mount up and fight against Saul. That's why. And he knew that David would be killed going against that many Philistines to get that many foreskins. David comes back with 200 foreskins of the Philistines and Saul is just enraged at him. 
He's getting so much attention. The Bible says that David was very fair to look upon. He's a real good-looking guy. And besides that, all the women liked him. So as of that point, as of chapter 19 through 31, Saul spends the rest of his life trying to kill David. Another story. I don't have time to go through that right now. So, I'm trying to tell you about all these gods that Israel was serving. So you don't get back into the Baal worship till 1 Kings. 1 Kings through 2 Chronicles. 1 Kings. 1 and 2 Kings. 1 and 2 Chronicles. There ain't nothing going on but Baal and Grove worship all through that. Baal and Grove. Why do you think God said, I've had my fill of you? I delivered you from Egypt and you do me this way? I, I, don't, I believe America is exactly like Israel was. Going after every God they can all the property they can get, all the the new Cadillacs and new this and new that. And the the thing is, that's the that gives you a lot of esteem in America, having a, a brand new Cadillac or a town car every other year. Gives you a lot of esteem. People think that you're made, you're really something. We want to worship you. The next thing that happens, Solomon builds the temple in 1 Kings. Starting in chapter 3, he prays that prayer to God. I am so young, I know not how to rule this, thy so great a people. If you noticed, I started off telling you about how I ended up understanding Christmas was pagan. I learned through this book I've run out of time I'll come back to chapter 11 of 1st Kings the next time if I can see this I don't think people can see the trouble we are in in America they have too much hope hope is fine if it's in Christ but if you have hope in this world Paul said if I have hope of things in this life only. I am of all men most miserable. This life is passing. It's over very quickly. Isn't it amazing how people you don't think are going to die and they die soon? Poof. They're gone. All these stars, they die quick. And believe at 83, I know I'm going to, I know I'm not going to live long, and I don't want to. I've never been so tired of a body as I am of this one in my life. I'm tired of the old Jim Brown. I'm not the man I used to be. I used to be worthless, just seeking my flesh. Let's pray, and I'm going to come back and talk some more about how I learned that Christmas was pagan by reading this book and defining these gods. We have been involved in Roman and Greek God worship with Christmas. It's all the same. It's the same gods that Israel was going after all through the Old Testament. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to live right and live godly and live holy. Lord, we know we'll have enemies doing this. Lord, it's very depressing. I, I, I get really, I go through months sometimes of depression, not because of a insecurity, but because the world hates your word. Fight our battles for us. Give us strength to continue and we'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen.
But that's the truth. I think God just reveals stuff to me and I don't know why me. That's enough, I guess. Hey, Tim. Thank you, Jim. Great message. I love you, man.